morning and uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about PA foreclosure. If I do so, I have two invisible hats on my head. One is the one that I'm from the working group of grown up congenital heart disease. So I'm intrinsically interested in holes and defects. And the other one is that I'm from Bern, Switzerland. And maybe a few of you may know that for many years we had Professor Meyer as head of cardiology. And he was an interventional cardiologist of the first hour and he closed many PFOs. So the question now for me, if I take a step back, is was he right in closing all these PFOs or was he wrong? And as you know, time will tell. So uh, I would like to show you what you know nowadays about PFO closure. I have nothing to disclose. I'm not an interventional cardiologist, so I'm not uh, keen on closing PFOs. You heard about cryptogenic stroke. If you talk about PFO, we talk about cryptogenic stroke. And you have heard that about 25% of patients with ischemic stroke will end up to have probably a cryptogenic stroke because standard workup, as we have heard with TTE, 24-hour Holter monitoring, images of the brain and the neck arteries and some routine blood work will not show you any cause. And in most of these cryptogenic stroke, we presume that embolic strokes will be the reason for the stroke. And we have also heard that, especially in the elderly patients, patients aged 60 or more, paroxysmal AFib is increasingly recognized as a source of cryptogenic stroke. But in younger patients, and we also know that if you have cryptogenic stroke, the risk of recurrence under aspirin is very low. It's in the range of 1 to 2% per year. And this might be a reason why it's quite hard to show efficacy in stroke prevention in patients with cryptogenic stroke. So cryptogenic stroke may have different etiologies. It may be due to AFib, I guess especially in the elderly patients. It may be due to aortic arch ateromas that we haven't found on TTE. It may be due to thrombophilias, or it may be due to a patent for Ramon Ovale. Now, patent for Ramon Ovale, we all have one during fetal life. And usually once we are born, then about three quarters of us, the PFO will close. But it remains open about 25% of all patients. And it acts like a flap-like opening between the right and left atrium, and it allows blood from the right atrium to cross to the left atrium. Its mean size in autopsy is about five millimeter. So it's large enough for clots to pass to obstruct brain arteries. The PFO or the shunt size is usually larger if we have an atrial septal aneurysm, and if we have some right atrial features like prominent valvular stachii, who directs the blood flow of the vena cava inferior to the region of the fossa ovalis. So the first report about a potential association between PFO and stroke was published in 1988. And Le Chat et al., he investigated 60 adults aged 55 years or younger with ischemic stroke and a normal cardiac exam. And he looked for the prevalence of right to left shunts on TTE. He also had a control group, healthy controls without stroke. And he showed that on TTE, the prevalence of a right to left shunt, mostly a PFO, was 10%. In stroke patients with identified cause, it was 20%. 20 in stroke patients with risk factors like hypertension, it was 40%. And in stroke patients without identified cause, the prevalence of a PFO was 50%. So it took not long to, to, to the, the, the first case reports were published about PFO closure in stroke patients. The first case reports were published in 1992, and it showed the feasibility of PFO closure in such patients. But it took another 20 years for randomized trials to be presented investigating the efficacy of PFO closure versus medical therapy. And at the year 2013, 
the knowledge, uh, the, the state of knowledge was that none of these trials has shown superiority of PFO closure versus medical therapy in the prevention of recurrent vascular events. So it's obvious that not all PFOs are the same. We have some stroke patients with incidental PFOs, and we have some stroke patients in whom the PFO might effectively be the reason for the stroke. And one way to sort this out is to create scores of probability. And the Rope score is just one of these scores that was published in 2013, and he tried to investigate the likelihood that the PFO might contribute to a cryptogenic stroke. This score, the Rope score, consists of age, the localization of the infarct, and clinical risk factors like smoking, diabetes, hypertension, and if it's the first stroke or a recurrence. And you can see if you are 30 years old, you have a cortical infarction, you don't smoke, you're not hypertensive, you know diabetes, then you have a score of 10. And 10 means that the chance that you will have a PFO is about 75%, and the chance that the PFO might contribute to the stroke is about 88%. And the recurrence rate is very low, in the range of 2% per year, as we expect. On the other hand, if you are 70 years of age, and you also have a PFO, but you are hypertensive, you have diabetes, a prior stroke, and lacuna infarction, then the prevalence of a PFO will be 25%, as in the general population, your recurrence rate will be high, 20% to two years, and the chance that the PFO <laughs> might contribute to your stroke risk is very low. So, at the end of 2016, what have we learned so far? We know that there are incidental PFOs and there are dangerous PFOs. And we know at this point in time that for stroke prevention, according to the AHA guidelines, PFO closure in patients without evidence of deep vein thrombosis or other reasons for paradoxical embolism, there is no data to support PFO closure over medical therapy. But we also have learned that in all the studies we have performed so far, study design matters. We have to think about how can we identify dangerous PFOs, we have to think about the length of follow-up, and maybe we have to think about the devices, which device we use and which we don't use. So, sometimes if you talk about PFO closure, it's like an epic battle between the good and the evil, between the interventional cardiologist and the neurologist, and actually, 2017, we can say a new era begins in, stroke, in PFO and stroke. Because in 2017, three papers have been published in the New England Journal of Medicine about PFO closure. And these are the three papers. I just try to summarize them. So we can see in, three, in these three papers, uh, the mean age of the patients was about 40 to 60. The duration of follow-up after PA closure for three to five years. The primary endpoint was recurrent stroke. The devices that were used was the Amplatz, 11 different devices in the French trial, or the Helix device in the reduced trial. And all patients that have been included were younger than 60 years of age, and all had a cryptogenic stroke in the six months prior to inclusion. And what these trials now showed, with this kind of selection, that in these circumstances, PFO closure was superior to medical therapy for the prevention of recurrent stroke. And the hazard rate, or the, the, the likelihood, was about 55 to, to, to 23%. So if we take now a step back and look at the evidence in 2017 about PFO and stroke, we have now an editorial in New England that says a PFO with a shunt should not longer result in categorization of a stroke as cryptogenic. <laughs> That's the opinion of the editorialist. But we also have learned that PFO closure patients below age 60 and cryptogenic stroke are 30 to 50% less likely to have stroke recurrence than patients with anti therapies. And if you try to calculate number needed to treat, you need to treat about 20 to 40 patient, patients to prevent one stroke over five years. This might be low, but if you are aged 40, and you have again 40 years to live, then in the long term, this may count for you. We know that there's a price to pay if, <coughs> if you close the PFO. You have device rate complications of two to three percent, 
and we can detect AFib in patients after device implantation, about 6%. So, so I tried to assess the potential way on how to approach PFO patients with a cryptogenic stroke. And this is not evidence-based, it's just, just my, my, my thoughts from the literature. But I think if you have a cryptogenic stroke in the PFO, if you are young, you have a large shunt, then you should go for PFO closure. On the other hand, if you are above age 60, then we have no evidence for PFO closure and medical therapy would be the treatment of choice. In the categories between, I think it depends on the clinical likelihood that the patient may have other risk factors for stroke, and then either we consider PFO closure or we consider medical therapy. So, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Excellent presentation. There's one question. <laughs> what does it mean, large chunk? I mean, because nowadays, based on G3 trials, many probably will close every single PFO with even two or three bubbles going through the PFO. The question is, how do you define large chunk to people that are not echocardiographists and like in world, like me? One way, but this is a cumbersome way, is to count bubbles. And if you have more than 30 bubbles, this may be a sign of a large shunt. But usually, you do a TEE. And on TEE, you can also measure the, shunt, the, the size of a shunt. And if you have a shunt of more than 5 millimeters, if you have 8 millimeters, 9 millimeters, then you have a large shunt. On the other hand, if you don't even see the hole, and you just see two bubbles crossing, because you see the bubbles arriving in the left atrium, then you know that you have a small, a small shunt.